I think people people think there's a big difference between being a performer mm. and being a teacher. Mm. And actually, I feel like what drives me as a performer mm. is the teaching element. Mm. Remembering that I'm doing this because I love sharing and teaching people and exposing people to new things. Mm. That's why I do it. Which is essentially, I mean, that's education. Yeah. But it's education through performance. Yes. So then it's important to me to play things and put things together in a way that people can understand. Mm. Let me welcome you into my living room. Yeah. And just share this music with you and explain to you what makes me excited about yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Because if I go into it with that attitude, it changes things tremendously. Mm. Welcome to the Orchestrating Your Career podcast. I'm your host, Rebecca, Becca for short, and I'm a clarinetist who studied at the Eastman School of Music and then went to London to get my master's and PhD, both at the Guildhall School of Music and Drama. Having shifted pathways in my own life, I love hearing about the varied careers musicians can have and how they got there. And that's precisely what we're exploring in this podcast. As I sit down with music graduates to chat about their unique musical journeys, hear their hard-earned wisdom, and learn about how they're orchestrating their own careers. For today's episode, I had the pleasure of chatting with Emiko Edwards, a pianist who attended Juilliard Pre-College for three years, then got her undergraduate degree from the Juilliard School, her master's from the Guildhall School of Music and Drama, and her doctorate from Temple University. She is a performer both here in the U.S. and abroad, as well as an educator, teaching as adjunct professor at St. Joseph's University, as head of the piano department at Luzerne Music Center, and teaching a private studio as well. As a wind player, I found it particularly interesting to hear Emiko's experiences studying piano through her different degrees. It was also fun to reminisce about our time studying in London, where we first met. She shares about the importance of figuring out your purpose as an artist and following your passion, as she has in her own musical journey through integrating education into performance. You're listening to a recording of Emiko performing Amy Beach's Ballade Op. 6 under this intro. Stay tuned till the end of the episode for some more of that performance, plus a clip of her performing Joan Towers' Piano Concerto with the Temple University Symphony Orchestra. And now let's get right into the interview. Hello, Emiko, and welcome to the Orchestra in Your Career podcast. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. Of course, it's really wonderful to reconnect with you here on this side of the pond, because even though we're both American, I actually met you in London when we were both studying at the Guildhall School of Music and Drama. You are an incredibly talented pianist, and I'm really excited to hear about all the different pieces that come into your career today. You're a teacher, you're a performer, doing all kinds of really cool things. But before all of that, could you just go back to the beginning for us and share how you got into classical music and why the piano? Sure. Well, I started when I was around five or six, Hmm. and my parents say that they had a toy keyboard in the house that I like to play with. And so they thought, let's set her up with piano lessons. Mm-hmm. So I started, yes, when I was about five or six. Mm-hmm. And it's something that just built and built and built. And I wasn't even interested in having a degree in music until mm-hmm. I was about 16 or wow. so. That's when I started thinking, maybe I'll do a double major. Mm-hmm. And that coincided with me starting at the Juilliard Mm pre-college. So it was really my experiences there, I think, that really pushed me in in that direction. And then when I was a senior, that's when I thought, okay, I'm just going to go all in and I'll just do the music degree. Mm. That's interesting because I feel like especially for pianists, and you started so early Mm -hmm playing the piano, but deciding at 16 feels maybe a little later than most pianists decide. Was there anything in particular that made you think you wanted to go for music? I don't know. I mean, it was just, I think, being in that environment with all those musicians Mm. and people that appreciated music. So this was Juilliard Pre-College. Yes, and I think that was really what Mm. just 
sparked a lot of excitement. I mean, before that, of course, there was drive, certainly, and interest, Mm -hmm. right? Because there was preparing for the audition process and then getting into that program. But I think really seeing and envisioning a life in music started after Mm -hmm. um, entering that point. Mm -hmm. How did you get involved in Juilliard pre-college? How did your parents and you find out about the program and the opportunity and how did you get in? Well, that's a good question. (laughs) (laughs) I grew up in New Jersey and Mm -hmm. so I was doing a lot of, I think, local things, local to the state, Mm -hmm. some of the MTNA activities and I think... We had some family friends who were also studying there. Mm -hmm. And so it was kind of word of mouth. Yeah, yeah. And then really we went specifically for my teacher, Mm -hmm. Julian Martin, who I studied with there. I think that was the main reason for me to go. Mm -hmm. Um, So I went and had a few lessons with him just to see what his teaching was like yeah. and what our dynamic was like. Mm-hmm. And I really enjoyed working with him. And that was a big part of me auditioning mm-hmm. to go there. Mm-hmm. And just, I think, spending a whole day in New York City yeah. and in classes. I remember my sister thought I was nuts <laughs> <laughs> to give up a whole weekend, a whole weekend essentially, yeah. to go and do more studying yeah but it really was just I think a highlight Mm. of my week what did that day look like what was a typical Juilliard pre-college day Mm. Saturday yeah lesson ear training music theory Mm. um chamber music and then I think I was part of a pilot program they were trying out where the chamber music group the members in lieu of orchestra they scheduled more rehearsal for us Mm -hmm. because I think many of us were coming from all over the country I knew someone who was flying in from Texas every week oh my goodness yeah so we were all coming in from different parts of the country so there really wasn't time to rehearse Mm -hmm. there was the coaching of course so they wanted to try and see how that would work if they scheduled in some additional rehearsal yeah um in addition to the coaching Mm -hmm. lunch with the other students Mm -hmm. we had a piano performance hour I believe as well so that was for all the pianists within the program and then studio class also Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so it was a pretty jam-packed day and then sometimes I would go to a New York film concert in the evening after the day was done Mm -hmm. so go in early Get Stay back late. very late. And my first year, I was still doing soccer. Mm. So I was playing varsity soccer in high school, too. So I would go to soccer practice Saturday morning, first thing. Oh, wow. Run home, shower, and then we'd drive into New York City and then do the whole day. Gosh. Come back. Talk about a packed schedule. Yeah. And that's really cool that you were able to get all of that experience and training at the high school level Mm because it seems it seems a lot like a college experience packed into one day a week Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it was amazing yeah so then transitioning from that to deciding to go major in music Mm -hmm. what was the audition process like how are you selecting schools to audition at and what did that look like I think I applied to about 20 Oh my gosh. Total. Not all conservatories. Okay. Maybe there were 12 or so. Mm-hmm. So I did 12 auditions, I think. Wow. So it was a lot. A lot of it was based, again, off teacher and finding teachers that felt I would work well with or mm-hmm. my teacher thought I would potentially work well with. I mean, granted, I continued on with my pre-college teacher. I yeah continued into the Juilliard College program uh-huh. and continued working with him. So then you went from applying to 20 schools, right. which is an incredible yeah. list and <laughs> amount of schools to apply to. I can't even right. imagine. I think I applied to like 11 or 12, and I thought that was insane. <laughs> I think it kind of was. Yeah. And I was even homeschooling at that time. So how on earth did you 
manage all of these different auditions while you're also in high school, while you are, right. you know, doing pre-college. It sounds like you're quite a busy kid. Yeah. So, Well, I think growing up, we lived in the car in the sense mm. that we were constantly driving to the next thing. We were yeah. eating in the car, sleeping in the car, doing yeah. homework in the car, right? Mm-hmm. And just constantly on move to do a lot of extracurriculars. Mm-hmm. And so I think the one thing that I learned, in addition to just enjoying things like playing soccer, was how to balance all these different mm-hmm. things in addition to the schoolwork that I was having to do. Yeah. What was also nice, I remember my senior year, they let me do something called, I think, senior project, some mm-hmm. sort of, they had an internship program okay. for seniors. Like independent study kind yeah, of Yeah, but you would take off the second half of your day. Wow. Yeah, so lunch would, we had an early lunch, I think 10.50. High school lunch was so was early now that I <laughs> It was very early. <laughs> so I would get out at 10.50. Mm-hmm. And I would go home. Yeah. They let me do an internship with myself wow. <laughs> as a pianist yeah. because I was taking the full day of classes yeah. on Saturdays. You're certainly doing enough. I yes. Imagine. So they said, okay, with the audition process and the Saturday school mm-hmm. and I think competitions too at that point. It's yeah. just, okay, that that's fair. You can yeah take off so I'd come home that was very nice but that was yeah. only from January okay onward yeah but just generally I think with all of the extracurriculars learning how to balance mm-hmm. things and manage time management yeah really important yeah skill mm-hmm. especially for musicians yeah. who are always it seems doing all kinds of different things right right so right. and I mean I see that even now in your career today where you're right. Doing a lot of different things. So it's nice to see how that carries through. Right. I think that's been a big part of <laughs> my life today mm. is just time management. Yeah. Skills. Yeah. So I'm just curious what the audition process looked like for Juilliard yeah. and maybe how that compared to some other auditions you remembered from that I think it crazy was, audition process. I mean, I think it was the same. Mm. I mean, conservatories had... I think, more stringent requirements yeah. than a university. So I did apply to universities, too, right. and music programs. But then those maybe had, time-wise, you had less minutes that you had to prepare. Mm-hmm. And then etudes, maybe Juilliard, I think, required two etudes. Mm-hmm. And the other places maybe required only one. Mm-hmm. So that was one extra thing. Curtis had a lot of show band requirements. I thought that was interesting. (laughs) They were a little different. But yeah, yeah, in terms of conservatory requirements, it was pretty much on par with the other schools that I applied to. Yeah. And when you went in for your audition, was it a panel of people, including your teacher? Mm -hmm. And did you feel having known him and worked with him that that helped you feel more comfortable in that audition? Uh, I don't know that. Or more pressure. Yeah. Because, you know, honestly, I found that audition extremely stressful. (laughs) (laughs) It was, it did not feel comfortable at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Well, I mean, you still got in. Yeah. So amazing (laughs) that you did. And I think that's a helpful reminder because I think a lot of times, I know even just from my auditions for music schools, some of the ones I thought I played the worst at were Mm -hmm. the ones I got in or got better scholarships than other places that I thought I did really well at and I didn't get in. And so you just never know. I think that one of my teachers used to talk about how (laughs) sometimes you really just don't know. Yeah. Um, And so that's why even today I'll perform and the first thing I do that day I watch Mm. watch the tape. If I have access, Mm. I watch it immediately. That Good discipline. Night. Not because I want to. Yeah. It's because I'm more, I want to hear the things that yeah. were niggling me yes. during the performance yeah. and check. Because then oftentimes I find, oh, yeah, that was fine. Not as bad just, as I thought. It was blown out of proportion in yeah. my head. And so it's more of just a way to... Mm decompress yeah that makes a lot of sense to me <laughs> I don't know if I 
would have the discipline to watch straight after because I feel like yeah. I just want to separate myself. But actually, I think it could be helpful because helpful because then I can put it away. Around. Yeah, yeah, I definitely. So I played a concert in October, mm-hmm. um, and that was my kind of Lincoln Center debut. So Amazing. It was at the New York Public Library for Performing Arts wow. the Lincoln Center, and it was all Copeland. Mm-hmm. And also, I also performed a sketch okay. that they had in the library, Copeland's. Oh, wow. So that was very cool. Yeah. Now, it was a two-pronged issue. One, they're very stringent about recording devices. Uh, so they had somebody recording, but it's taking some time, obviously, to get that recording back. Mm-hmm. So I didn't have a recording device of my own. Yeah. So that was tough yeah. knowing that oh there were some things that really were bothering me but then I thought oh well if I were to listen to the recording there are probably things that I would feel like that was okay mm-hmm. and then the second part was I knew there was a reviewer mm-hmm. and so the whole night I felt okay about the performance but yeah. then it was oh I wonder how the reviewer felt about yeah. the performance and I had checked I had checked when does the reviewer put out the reviews yeah. typically so I knew the next day around 2 p.m. there would be a review wow quick turnaround yeah yeah I so. guess that's journalism so yeah right <laughs> so but I was you know that was bugging me the mm. whole night so but it all worked out yeah I'm sure it was very positive yeah. so oh was amazing good. yeah I read some I think on Facebook and yeah. it sounded <laughs> I was not surprised <laughs> So at Juilliard for your undergrad, mm-hmm. how did that experience compare to mm. pre-college? What was that like? What was the course like? I mean, obviously it was different because you're there full time for a right. degree now. Well, it was, I don't know, it was very different. It certainly felt more competitive yeah. amongst the student body, particularly amongst the pianists, mm-hmm. which was, it was tough. Yeah, it was tough. And I think each year we had 12 pianists. Okay. In each class. In each, yes. Okay. In each class. Mm -hmm. So it was a very, very, very small program. Yeah. Studied with my teacher. Mm -hmm. Same one I had in pre-college, of course. It was very busy. Mm. I don't know. I, I think we've talked about this before that in Europe... You have a lot more flexibility and actually time outside of classes where I feel like in America, everything's much more structured Mm -hmm. and there's a lot more academic classes, I think. Yeah. And so that was a very big adjustment, actually, Mm -hmm. even though high school was very busy yeah right if we think back to that yeah now, wow I was in classes from mm. 8 a.m. to 3 essentially yeah. every day mm-hmm. and college was not like that but yeah. somehow it felt more difficult I guess yeah the college transition mm-hmm. there were a lot of academic requirements and I think it was easy to just get caught up in fulfilling the requirements of the degree yeah right and then not looking beyond the school which mm-hmm. is I think a big problem yeah right with music degrees in general is getting out of the school and looking beyond and trying to connect with the larger community yeah and so yeah I was so caught up in trying to fulfill all these requirements that I didn't quite push and I think it requires a lot of pushing on your own part too Mm -hmm. right to push yourself to do that yeah because it is an extra effort in a sense Mm -hmm. if it's something beyond just what you need to fulfill that degree it Mm -hmm. feels like extra yeah whereas I think it's really important to try and learn that early yes so that you can do that when you leave school which is something in retrospect I'm now starting to yeah understand more yeah, I think that's really important, and I think it's so easy to do, and it's the experience of a lot of musicians, I know from my own experience and other people I've talked to, especially in undergrad, I think it's so easy to get very stuck in what's happening and your requirements, like right, you're saying, and right. the next assessment, 
the next exactly, exam. Right. So it's really it's hard. A bit of a bubble. Yeah, and especially in such a competitive environment, mm-hmm. I think everyone is like that. So mm-hmm. it's hard to break out of that mold. Right. Right. Um, I'm wondering what your goals and aspirations were for your career, mm-hmm. because as a pianist, a lot of pianists maybe think about a solo career or. Hmm. Along those lines, whereas I'm a wind player, mm-hmm. it's your thinking more orchestral yeah. career. What were you thinking for your career? I, I honestly was not thinking that far ahead. Mm. <laughs> but also, I kind of, I felt like in some ways, I almost self-eliminated hmm. from the performing career. Really? Even Why? in undergrad, I was thinking, well, I, I, I'm just going to go be a professor. So I you were thinking teaching. teaching. I mean, I was already thinking about how much I loved teaching and mm-hmm. I think that so much we all have so much respect for our professors and our teachers and yeah. so all of them being such huge role models yes. to me was really inspiring and made me think man I, re- I really want to do that mm. and I think I would imagine as a pianist your relationship with your teacher would be Mm -hmm. so important I think for all musicians it is because you have such an intimate relationship with your teacher they're teaching you so much they're guiding you so much but I think as a wind player you also have a lot to do with your section and your conductor and you know in orchestra and band there's a lot more community work I imagine than with a pianist you're a lot more playing by yourself Mm -hmm. so did you feel like that was the case in your experience um I mean yeah there was a lot of time spent alone yeah in the practice rooms which also I'm an extrovert so that was a problem (laughs) (laughs) because I really enjoy yeah being around people well and maybe that's why teaching then also was right that was very exciting for you yeah I mean I loved performing but I think just the stability of the teaching profession too it was mm-hmm. also maybe more practical yeah I just and then also of course getting stuck within the grind and fulfilling your requirements right I just didn't really think that far ahead yeah I think that makes yeah. a lot of sense and I would imagine especially as a pianist because I know wind players practice a lot but my impression is always that pianist <laughs> practice a lot how yeah. much were you and your peers like practicing oh gosh, on a daily amount basis? probably honestly <laughs> I just I would I would remember I could easily go a week without touching the pavement mm-hmm. because I don't know if you've ever visited Juilliard I've been a couple of times okay, so you have the dorm building yeah and then you have that raised walkway yeah that goes to the main building uh-huh and the cafeteria is in the dorm building. Yeah. So you just, you sleep, you eat, you walk across, you go to class. You practice. And you practice. <laughs> and then you do it. And we would stay till building closed, which mm. I think was midnight. Oh, wow. Or 11. Yeah. Midnight. Late. Yeah. And I know of people that would also sleep in the building. <laughs> yeah. Get in those hours. <laughs> right? Wow. <laughs> but uh, I never did that. Um, but yeah, you would just go between the two buildings, mm-hmm. right? Raised, and then the ground is here. So you would never touch the And I would realize that, that at the end of the week, oh my gosh, I haven't actually touched the ground mm. in a week. Gone out. Which it. isn't good either. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it's finding, I think, balance. Um, and I think from that, I learned when I moved to the UK, right? Mm-hmm. I got to get out of the school and really take advantage of the environment and go to concerts. And yeah, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I think we took a lot of things for granted in undergrad, right? Yeah. You kind of get stuck. Absolutely. Yeah. So I think it's cool to hear a contrast in you realizing that and then how you were able to combat that in your master's experience. Which was at Guildhall. So how did you find out about Guildhall? What made you want to study abroad in the UK? And how did the application process for that work? Well, I think the name of it, I think I knew someone who Mm -hmm. studied there, Abigail Sin. Okay. Might have been there when you were there. Oh, I'm sure. Pianist. Mm -hmm. So she, I had seen, again, social media. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, of course, Ronan. So that was the big 
the big thing. Mm-hmm. Studying with him at Banff, which mm-hmm. unfortunately is no longer a thing, but oh. Orford is still there. Mm-hmm. These are both in Canada. These are the programs that allowed me to study with other mm-hmm. professors and get a sense of what these teachers were like yeah. and if they were people that I would be interested in studying with mm-hmm. down the line. And so Banff was a big deal because I met Ronan mm-hmm. Amora, who's head of keyboard at Guildhall. Yes. And so I managed, I had a good number of lessons with him in Banff. Mm-hmm. And so Banff was really an amazing place. They had professors yeah. from all over the world who That's come amazing. for three weeks in the what summer. What year, were, what summer were you doing that? It would be 2013. Okay. So was that the summer before your last year at Juilliard? Okay. My teacher at Juilliard, I think he was also very supportive. Mm -hmm. He wanted his students to go study with other people during the summers. Yeah. To just get different feedback. Yeah. A new perspective. Things. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So that was nice. Um, He was extremely supportive and encouraged that Mm -hmm. a lot. Um, so I met Ron in there and, and I got to study with him there in addition to one other Juilliard professor, which was really nice. Mm -hmm. And, and my teacher at Juilliard was very adamant that I do something different. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, it was very clear. I I think I had gotten comfortable. Yeah. Too comfortable. Mm -hmm. I had been there for seven years. Exactly, yeah. And so he was saying, you need to do something different. You have to broaden your horizons. Mm -hmm. So he really actually pushed for me to go. Really? Yeah. It was not something that I was very seriously considering, actually, Mm -hmm. in the summer. It was, oh, wouldn't that be fun Mm -hmm. to (laughs) go away to London? But I don't know. I mean, it doesn't seem likely but I'll apply anyway and I enjoyed working with Ronan I mean he was a huge part because I knew nothing about the school really Mm -hmm. and then the more my Juilliard teacher and I talked about it and I was trying to make a decision in the end whether to stay in New York at Mm -hmm. Juilliard and do a master's there or move to London Mm -hmm. and do a master's there and he just was saying you need to go you need to get out you need to do something different anything would be better <laughs> than staying here. Exactly. In uh, his eyes it was just, yeah. I had to just get out of my comfort zone because I, I grew up in New Jersey. Mm. My dad was still working in the city, right? I had been there for seven years. Mm. I was coming home to teach on the weekend yeah. to my parents. And I just needed to do something completely different. Mm-hmm. And I think, Ronan's style of teaching was also extremely different, mm-hmm. right? I mean, they're both amazing teachers, yeah. but just completely different in terms mm-hmm. of um, the way that they taught. Yeah. So it made a lot of sense, I think, both artistically and personally, mm-hmm. just in terms of growth Yeah. for me to go um, mm-hmm. and move to London. I think my parents had a hard time with it. Initially, when yeah. I was making that decision, they really wanted me to stay. At Juilliard? Yes. Oh. They saw, I think, a lot of risk in going someplace foreign, right? Yeah. I had done everything in America yeah. and been at Juilliard this whole time. Mm-hmm. And was it a risk to leave, maybe? And... But they, I think they agreed <laughs> that it was the right decision. Yes. Yeah. 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 So. What was the application process like for applying mm. and getting into the for program? Guild Hall. It was a lot earlier than America. Mm-hmm. That's what I remember. Yeah. Um, I did the live audition in New York City. Okay. I think that they had live audition in London, too. Mm-hmm. But that's in the fall. Mm -hmm. Typically, the American auditions are February, March. Right. And so Guildhall comes at the beginning of January. Oh, okay. To Manhattan. Mm -hmm. And so I did an audition there in New York City, which Mm -hmm. was convenient. I took the subway down from school. (laughs) Yeah. Did you meet anyone from Guildhall at that audition that you then Um, saw when you went? A couple. The panel people. 
that was about it. Mm-hmm. Um, Jonathan Vaughn was there. Ah, amazing. Yeah. Hello, Hello. Hello. Yeah. So there was a lot of fun. It's so cool. Yeah. Um, and I think he's now the new principal. He is. Yeah. yeah he was the new principal. I think someone from the vocal department was on the panel. Mm-hmm. And someone in administration. Mm-hmm. So it was a very small, small group. Yeah, yeah. But all very, very, very friendly. Yeah. Very nice. Of course. So, mm-hmm. Yeah. So had you hadn't been to London before? I had never been. Had you been? You'd been abroad before, though? I had, yes. Okay. Spain. Mm. So Europe. I think just Spain, actually, before mm-hmm. moving to London. Mm-hmm. And Japan, of course. I'm half Japanese. Yes. Yeah. Canada. Mm-hmm. I think that was it. So pretty big deal to move to yeah, a new to place move, that you've never been right? to. Right. I had no other, I guess, exposure to Guildhall, really, before mm-hmm. attending. I had yeah. never been to London. I had never been to the school. And it was a really big jump of faith yeah. to just move across the world. I watched some YouTube videos yeah. just to get a sense of what the student body was like uh-huh. and the general vibe and... I could tell even from the videos that mm-hmm. everyone seemed very warm and welcoming. And that was reflected when I arrived in London. Everyone was so friendly. Mm-hmm. And the pianists there were extremely tight knit. Yeah. It was very different. I had never seen anything like that. Mm-hmm. I think at music festivals, you get a taste of that. Right when you go abroad and you're with some musicians for a short period of time, mm-hmm. I feel like there isn't really space for competitiveness yeah. in those situations. Yeah. It's a different feel. It is different. And it was more like that mm-hmm. in the at Guildhall actually. Yeah. And yeah. I, I think it was unique to Guildhall. I don't yeah. think it was a London thing. I think it was a Guildhall thing from mm-hmm. what other people have told me mm-hmm. about their experiences in other conservatories in London. But yeah, the pianists would have pianist drinks. <laughs> we got to the pub. Yes, exactly. All together. Yeah. Which was so different. Yeah. It's very different, but it yeah. was amazing. What was that transition period like and settling into a new country? Oh, well, you were very helpful. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if you remember, you were my I do remember. Buddy. I don't remember my buddies. <laughs> yeah, right. So we had the Guildhall buddies. Mm-hmm. Who, International student buddies, yeah. Yes, and that was so helpful. Mm-hmm. And the phone plans. Yeah. So cheap. Yeah. Because you told me about Gifka. Yes. Whenever I visit London, pounds, which I is the equivalent them. of twenty dollars <laughs> per month here, yeah, for it's an, insane. Uh, actually, an amazing amount of data, mm-hmm. like eight gigs or something. Yeah, yeah, that's um, a good deal. Yeah, Lloyd's Bank. Mm-hmm. Took your advice on that. <laughs> um, it was yeah, it was a big I think adjustment. Our flat was very odd, mm. so I moved into that flat without having seen it. Mm. I think that was through Facebook. Oh, gosh. Other Guildhall students yeah. who needed a third roommate. Yeah. And the bathroom had carpet. Oh, bizarre. It was gross. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was in an ex-council flat. And okay. So we had three bedrooms that were on three floors. It was mm. a very narrow. Yeah, a lot of London houses. Are very like narrow that. with mm. multiple levels and carpet in the shower and bathroom. It's an experience, and it I is. yeah, because I I feel I had a similar experience because I also had never been to London before. I've never been out of the country before. I moved to London, and it's such a new thing. I mean, it's it is English speaking, of course, mm-hmm. but the culture is so different, and yeah. you know, experiencing a lot of new things, trying to right. figure out a lot of new well, things. The cult, it's interesting because I feel like I didn't actually meet many British people. Oh, really? Just because. Guildhall was so international. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in that sense, it didn't feel mm. like a big adjustment that culturally. Makes, yeah, that makes sense. I think I agree. Guildhall is so international. I got really stuck into a local church, and I felt mm. like that's where I met a lot I of see. British people. Okay. But it makes sense, yeah, because the student body is just yeah. so diverse. Right, right. So I think that was helpful. I liked that it was funny, my friends who had lived in London a long time would always say, oh, it's so fast-paced and Mm. aggressive. 
And to me, it felt so many notches slower than yeah. New York City. Yeah. Yeah. New yeah. York, to me, felt very aggressive. Mm. And so coming to London, it still was busy. It was exciting. There a was lot a to lot do. to see, a lot to do. But it mm. didn't have that element of aggression that I felt yeah. was too much for me personally yeah. in yeah. New York City. I would agree. And I think I feel very fortunate. I feel my experience of London has always been very positive. Yeah. And to me, it feels like a really lovely, friendly city because mm-hmm. everyone I met there, even strangers in the tube and stuff, everyone was always kind and polite mm-hmm. and friendly and helpful. I'm sure other people have had other experiences. experiences. Yes, yeah. but yeah. I feel I, would, I feel the same about it actually. So loved it. Yeah. How was your course at Guildhall? Yeah. How was that compared? Because you were talking a little bit before about academics. Yeah, and just the difference yeah, between UK right, and US. Right. Well, I think that Guildhall there was a lot of flexibility to really do what you were interested in, mm-hmm. and then also in terms of just repertoire, there were no real repertoire requirements aside from time. You could play really whatever you wanted to, which is kind of amazing. Mm -hmm. So I felt like that was where I really got to explore things that were maybe a little bit more out of the box. Yeah. Guildhall was also very well positioned in that it was part of the Barbican Center yeah. and there was a really nice relationship between the two that went beyond just performing in the Barbican Center. Yeah. So they were hooked up with BBC as well. And so through that relationship, I was able to perform on two of the BBC Total Immersion series, mm. which were amazing, amazing opportunities. Yeah. Could um, you explain a little bit about what that yeah, series so is? so BBC Total Immersion... They spend the entire weekend exploring one composer. And mm-hmm. so the ones that I was involved with were Richard Rodney Bennett okay. and Henrik Goretzky. Mm. And those were a lot of fun. So they asked for a Guildhall pianist to perform some solo piano works. And so Ronan asked if I would be interested. Mm. And so I played live and BBC recorded it live and Mm -hmm. put it on the radio Mm -hmm. which was very cool yeah I remember doing that as well and I think it's such an amazing thing to be part of as a student yes and it's it's just a cool series it's very educational and it's nice to hone in on you know one particular composer and explore and that actually inspired me to do the all Copeland right because I think it is really interesting to Mm -hmm. just focus on one composer Mm -hmm. and really feel like even for somebody who doesn't know anything about the composer just to hear the variety of works yeah you really start to get a sense Mm -hmm. of who they were Mm -hmm. I think which is very nice I also performed in the Barbican Sound Unbound Festival Mm -hmm. which is I think that's geared towards people who know nothing about classical music. Yeah. So I did a two piano recital with my duo partner for that, and that was a lot of fun. Um, but the school was just very had a lot of really good partnerships mm. within the area, yeah. and I guess that goes back to getting beyond just that bubble yeah. of being within the school, mm-hmm. which I think is so important. Coursework wise, I remember when I got there for my master's, I could have gotten away with literally just doing performance based activities. Mm. So I believe we had to choose two electives, or I think they were called called 40 credits, Mm -hmm. and you could divide them into two. Yeah. So 20, 20, or you could do four, 10. Yeah. And I think I took the four. 10 option Uh because I wanted to make sure that long term if I was coming back to the US to a doctorate I had to make sure that I had some more academic courses Mm -hmm. to show on my 
my record. Yeah. So I did medieval Renaissance studies. <laughs> wow. And classical studies, mm. which were actually, interestingly, very performance practice based. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And that's very cool. I felt like a lot of the courses over there were more about performance practice. Yeah. And so, yeah, which for me as a pianist, medieval Renaissance studies, like, I don't know how much <laughs> that informed my piano playing, <laughs> but it was very interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then, of course, chamber music. Mm-hmm. And I think I worked with other composers at the school. Mm-hmm. So that was very cool to be able to work with um, yeah, student composers. Exactly. But if I wanted to, I could have just done chamber music for 20 mm. and worked with composers, I think, for 20. Yeah. And then just did my other playing requirements mm-hmm. and bypassed any sort of written or... Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting that you had the foresight. Were you thinking that you were going to come back and do a doctorate in the U.S.? I, I think I figured I was going to do a doctorate. Okay. And when I initially moved to London... Yes. And then that started to shift to maybe I'll stay Mm. and do a doctorate in the UK. And then ultimately, I think just with where immigration was headed over there, it just seemed to be getting more and more restrictive on students who are looking to transition into staying that I thought maybe this isn't the time Mm. to do a doctorate in the UK. Yeah. And I also knew that if I wanted to then work in academia in the U.S., then maybe it made more sense for me to become more familiar with the U.S. uh, academic system. Yeah, Yeah. that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But I did a master's, and then I did a one-year artist diploma as well. Both at Guildhall? Yes. Okay, so you were there for a total of three years. Three years. Which was, I think, the perfect amount of time. Mm -hmm. It was really nice. What would you say were some highlights of your experience well, I guess the performing opportunity mm. I mentioned, those were great. Working with Ronan, of course. I also benefited a lot. I worked with the Alexander Technique. Oh, yeah. Teacher, yeah. Nally Benoir. And so she and I are still quite close, mm. actually. And she's 90, I believe. Oh, wow. She knows how to do the Zoom lessons. So <laughs> I'll do some Zoom Alexander Incredible. She runs these, yeah, she runs these piano Alexander technique courses, which look at the relationship between those two things. And so I found that actually very beneficial. um, And I think it's changed a lot about how I approach Mm. physically playing the piano, Mm. which, yeah, that's been really great. So working with her... In addition, of course, to just working with Ronan, who was fantastic. Mm -hmm. And I think he taught me how to approach performing in a different way, Mm -hmm. too. How to really work on performing. Yeah. And I think Guildhall was really good in the sense that the performance requirements were so much in comparison Mm -hmm. to the U.S. requirements. Mm -hmm. We, of course, had juries in America, which you pre- you prepare an hour and they hear 15 yeah. minutes. And, I mean, I feel bad for the professors in London. They mm. have to sit through an hour's recital for every single student mm-hmm. every year. It's a lot. Yeah. In addition to the mid-year, right, then we have the other half-hour mm-hmm. performance requirement. And then whatever else extra they were also doing on top of mm-hmm. that, right? So just... The huge amount of performing opportunities that you got at Juilliard, I I mean, I really kind of floated through a little bit. Mm -hmm. So you could go the entire year and just do your one jury at the Mm -hmm. end. And you really don't learn how to perform, I think, Mm -hmm. from preparing for a jury. That's a different, it's a different mentality. Yeah. Right? Knowing that oh, they're going to stop me about halfway through. Yeah. So just make sure the first half of the piece is really good. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Even for auditions, right? It's mm-hmm. just, it's so, so, so different. Mm. I remember for Guildhall, one of my end-of-year assessments was put on a recital. But what made this one different was 
you did every component of it. You yeah. found the venue. You marketed right. it. Right. You, you know, you made up everything about it. Right. And I do remember that, too. Yeah. And I remember loving that flexibility and the freedom and responsibility. And it felt very helpful as, as you know, part of my master's course of learning these skills to help transition into, right. you know, performing outside of career. school. Yeah. Right. I yeah. do remember that too. So, and London's was great in having a lot of places available. Right. So there are churches, exactly, to perform at. And so it, was, it wasn't as difficult. Right. Or as daunting of a task, perhaps. Yeah. I'm curious about your transition back from the UK to the US. So how did you end up coming back because you ended up doing your doctorate here yeah, in the U.S. at right, Temple. Right. So what made you decide to come back and do your doctorate here? And what was that, you know, experience like? Was there a reverse culture mm. shock or anything? Or, you know, how was it coming right. back? Well, so we had been in, I had been in London, in New York, then London, and then it was Philadelphia. Mm. And initially, uh, I missed London ton yeah we worked it out actually so my now husband Mm -hmm. then boyfriend at the time he was also doing medical school in London so Mm -hmm. we met in London and it was a two year in London and then he could have stayed and done the last two years there or do the last two years in America Mm -hmm. and then it was a lottery system Mm -hmm. West Virginia or Philly. Mm. So then I started looking at the Northeast again. Mm. I'm from New Jersey and mm. what kind of doctorate programs are available. Yeah. And in Philadelphia, I found that the only school that actually offered a doctorate was Temple. Wow, really? Yeah. It's the oh. only doctorate program. Hmm. Huh. Interesting. In Philadelphia. Uh-huh. And I mean, there were other options, of course. I could go back to New York. Mm-hmm. Um, but then I started looking at who was on faculty there, and they had just some really amazing professors. Mm. I worked with Dr. Sarah Davis Buchner. I worked a lot with Lambert Orcus, and it all worked out that I got into the doctorate program, and then he was also going to Jefferson mm. to do the last two years of his medical school. So we were able to time it mm. together. But yeah, doing an American doctorate, just I think the amount of coursework that was involved in addition to the performance requirements, because there were quite a few performance requirements compared to doing an undergrad or Mm -hmm. even a master's in America. And then, of course, writing what we call a monograph. Hmm. What is that? You did have to write a dissertation, essentially. Oh, okay. It's called a monograph. Yeah. And the DMA. Okay. It's called a monograph. Mm-hmm. And at least at Temple. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. what they call it. And that was hefty in addition to all of the concerts that I had to do. I ended up writing I think 145 pages and wow. a lot of research. Yeah. And that was largely done in my fourth and fifth year. Mm. So I did a five-year doctorate. Okay. Mm-hmm. And I mean, one of the requirements of doing the doctorate at Temple is that you play with orchestra. Uh, well, just twist my arm. I know. So, and with COVID, obviously, mm. too, I really wanted to play with orchestra. And yeah. so that, we had to push that back. So I did that in the spring of 2022 before I graduated. Mm-hmm. But I think that Temple really took very good care of us. Um, those who were in the doctorate program I had a my one rule was I'm not paying for Mm -hmm. school I'm going to have school pay me yeah (laughs) so Temple was extremely generous in that I was a TA Mm -hmm. I was not paying I mean between the TA and scholarship yeah I think the first year also the subsidy Mm. salary essentially was 13k in addition to covering everything else Mm. and then the second third fourth year was 18 amazing and not paying for school yeah so and then they lent me a steinway for my apartment wow right so these are all part of the yeah the deal right just the funding Mm. 
the access to a good instrument in mm-hmm. my apartment, mm-hmm. working with amazing faculty members. And then also just, I really wanted to get a university doctorate degree hmm. because I had done the conservatory yeah. degrees and I thought, well, if I'm looking to then teach at a university, I should probably understand what that looks like. Yeah. So that's why Temple made a lot of sense too. Mm. And then within Temple, I got so much experience teaching, mm. um, working with non-majors or majors who had to take piano as a secondary instrument or people who were majoring in music therapy mm. or music education whose primary instrument was piano. Yeah. And so all of that experience, and then I had also done some work as a teaching fellow at Juilliard. Mm. I taught class piano in my undergrad. Mm. Yeah. I had to hide my age. (laughs) I had students that were older than me. Oh, (laughs) wow. Yeah. All of that experience came together to where I was then able to, I guess, interview and win an adjunct job Mm. at St. Joseph's University while I was still in the doctorate Mm. program. And so that was really great. Yeah. Yeah. So I kind of got a head start in, mm-hmm. that, in that sense. Yeah. And so I've been teaching there since fall of 2019. Wow. And now we're 2023. Yeah. yeah. Five years. Almost, yeah, yeah. At the end of spring, I uh-huh. guess. Long Look at time. you. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah. So I graduated in 2022. Mm. And then this, I guess it's really been one full year, mm-hmm. a year and a half. Yeah. Since finishing the doctorate. Okay. And so I think it's been a very kind of crazy transition mm-hmm. going from being in school forever to then coming out of yeah. school and then realizing that if you want to perform, you need to go get the opportunities for yourself. Mm-hmm. And then how there are all these skills, I think, that I then had to teach myself mm-hmm. Or ask, make a lot of phone calls to friends and other people who had graduated before me to understand how this industry works, Mm -hmm. which I think that there, there has to be some change probably in education Mm -hmm. or performance majors Mm -hmm. that this is more of a core that there's some sort of core business requirement mm. in conservatories also. Because you felt in your experience there were a lot of things I had, had to learn. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that it's the general consensus. Everyone that I've talked to, if they say the same thing. Mm. That they had to essentially teach themselves these skills once they left school. Yeah. Um, I think that in school we learn how to play our instruments Mm -hmm. and kind of I mean not perfect because there's no such thing but perfect our craft yeah but then there's not really any sort of conversation around okay but then how do we make money Mm -hmm. with that what do I do exactly perfected the craft right yeah right so then it was a lot of how do I write letters to Mm. concert organizations Mm. and what is my brand yeah yeah who am I what do I have to offer Mm -hmm. revamping and designing redesigning my website yeah and also applying for university positions Mm -hmm. and what does that entail I mean a huge undertaking yeah right absolutely cv the cover letter um all of your materials Mm -hmm. what is an appropriate fee to ask for how do you negotiate that um contracts Mm -hmm. reviewers so i was trying to figure out how to get reviewers to my concert yeah. in So October. you I brought went and you. found the reviewer. Wow. <laughs> okay, now, there are some shady things out there. Okay. And this is what I discovered. That there are some reviewers that require you to pay. <gasps> pay for their review. Oh, I gotcha. 
And I thought, there's no way I am paying someone <laughs> to review. I'm sorry. I'm not yeah. doing that. It's not. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, and then it's also finding reviewers and organizations that align with mm. the kind of concert. You're and mater- Exactly. So I was performing all Copeland, and I found that New York Classical Review, mm. they like to champion American music. Mm. Or they are interested in promoting yes. American music. So I went and found the email contact of the head of New York Classical Review. Mm. And I wrote him an email and said, hey, I'm putting on this concert at the New York Public Library at Lincoln Center. And it's all Copeland. And I thought it might be something that you and your reviewers might be interested in. Mm. And he wrote back and he said, oh, great program. Um, No promises but I'll keep your program in mind the mm-hmm. next month. So I wrote him about a month prior. Because that was another thing. When you when yeah. you set that up. And so everyone I asked, all of my friends, no one had a clue. <laughs> they said, if you, if you find out anything, let, let me know. <laughs> so I wrote him about a month prior, which mm-hmm. I think was the right thing. Because okay. it seems like, okay, maybe they, the head person, maybe they assign mm-hmm. the reviewers to different concerts about a month in mm-hmm. advance. And then... He wrote me a few weeks later to say, I will be sending a reviewer. Wow. And I thought, okay. <laughs> and so we had to get the reviewer VIP seats, mm-hmm. the New York Public Library, made sure that they had a spot. Mm-hmm. And they were asking, okay, can we have his name or email to put the set aside? But there was obviously no contact between me or that reviewer mm-hmm. or that. But it's interesting, right? It all came from sending an email. Yeah. And the concert, actually, at the New York Public Library, that was from sending an email. Mm. I was going to ask, how did that even happen? Yeah. And what, what was just, the thought process behind even doing well, it? Well, so actually, I went to play this program at Rutgers University Okay, last fall. You were invited, or you asked them? Email. I'm telling you, it's all I, the majority. The, of, uh, the majority of what I do <laughs> is emailing. Is emailing. Amazing. And but that was a huge shock yeah. after leaving school. Yeah, I had to think. Okay, so the majority of my time is going to be sending emails, many of which will not get responses. Mm-hmm. And is this something like okay? So this is what this is. Mm-hmm. And is this something that I am? okay with doing and do I like this as a Mm. profession right but that was the question I was asking myself once I left school like now I know what it is Mm. I didn't know before yeah that 70% of my time would be looking up concert organizations yeah figuring out if they align with what I'm offering as an artist and then crafting an email that's going to catch someone's attention Mm. and explain me in one or two sentences right a lot of admin. A lot of admin. Yeah. I imagine most students in music school who are looking to do a career like yours, mm-hmm. you know, freelance yeah, right. musician performing career, don't realize that that is How the case. How much admin yeah. is involved. And then there are other things that you start to pick up on. I mean, I asked other friends, can I see a copy of the email that you've sent to mm-hmm. people? And then they told me, oh, well never send an an email on a Monday because you're more likely to get a, you're not going to get a response. Like Uh aim for Tuesday or Wednesday, Mm -hmm. right? So then I spend Monday (laughs) crafting a bunch of emails and then I send off a batch on Tuesday or Wednesday during my lunch break between teaching at the university, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of a a mixed bag of things right so I'm adjunct teaching at St. Joseph's University right now I'm going in two days a week Mm -hmm. and then I have a very tiny amount of private students and then the rest of my time is devoted to emailing and practicing Mm -hmm. but now that is you know I am privileged in the sense that it's a joint income household not everyone has that kind of I guess like underlying support financially yeah. where yeah. like if I don't book that concert it's gonna derail know, everything exactly yeah. so yeah. I mean I do want to put that out there mm-hmm. that that was something that I also had to decide mm-hmm. because I was doing more 
um, teaching. I was teaching at Solomon Music School okay. in addition to SGU for a time. And then COVID hit, and yeah. the number of students went down. And then I was living outside Center City and with the reduced number of students. It just didn't make sense for me anymore to make that commute in. And mm. so I had a conversation with my now husband about money and finances and where I was going to put my energy Mm -hmm. and how we felt about me just taking a step back from that, sticking with my college teaching and just trying to invest more of my time and energy Mm -hmm. into practicing and performing Yeah, and perhaps like financially tighter, but then I'm using my time in a different way. And that was something that we were both on board with and okay with. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's definitely, it's tough. I mean, I can't imagine the amount of just pressure of trying to teach a gazillion private students Mm -hmm. to financially be very, very, very comfortable. Yeah. And then on top of that, practicing. But then having the mind space to then go and do all of this. Essentially, it's research, right? Yeah. It's, yeah. A, a lot of it is research. Mm-hmm. It's researching organizations and what are their underlying values and mm-hmm. messages. But I think this started with you asking me how I got, why I even emailed them. Yeah. was because I went to go play for Ursula Oppens, who plays a lot of modern and new American music. Okay. I played the program the program for her um I went to see her for a lesson Mm -hmm. and I asked her I said it seems like it's kind of tough to market an all Copeland recital (laughs) uh, to people do you Mm -hmm. have any suggestions yeah and so she said oh they had that concert series at the New York Public Library Mm -hmm. so I wrote them and I said first flop and suggested that I write you (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I did a little name drop. Of course. <laughs> That's what you gotta do. But then it worked out and I mean what an amazing thing for mm. me to come back. I mean, that was my first time performing in New York City since I was a student there. Yeah. In Lincoln Center. Mm. So it was a very full circle moment. I yeah. felt a lot of pressure, I have to admit, mm. about just this concert, right? Yeah. And I imagine. um but emailing. Who would have thought the importance of the email? Well, and then also, I guess, just, like, language. Yeah. And understanding how to write a compelling email and a message that will catch someone's attention. And then what kind of programs are you offering? Mm -hmm. And so I kind of have strange and weird concert programs <laughs> they're not normal exactly and I think that I'd like to think that that's what's hopefully making me an attractive mm. candidate for yes. these concert series yeah so the all Copeland and then I did an all American program mm. at the music school of Delaware this past summer I was there visiting guest artists mm-hmm. so I did a recital a master class and I did some guest teaching that week and mm-hmm. it was so much fun just the combination of performing and teaching yeah I really enjoy yeah all of that together and Lizard mm-hmm. Music Center I teach there in the summer mm-hmm. that's also with pre-college students okay so the majority of my pre-college work actually is in the summers mm-hmm. perform there with the other faculty we do chamber music and I usually get assigned the weird stuff, <laughs> the more modern things, because I think that the, they know that that's what I do. Yeah. I do things that are kind of different, mm. and I like playing new things and exposing people to things that they haven't heard before. Mm-hmm. So the All-American program, Copeland, Beach, Bonds, Price, Crumb. Mm-hmm. A little different, yeah. but all the pieces were very accessible. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I'm preparing an homage program, mm-hmm. which is all about composers celebrating composers, oh. which I'm really excited about. And those are more normal <laughs> in the sense that the composers are more easily recognizable, Traditional. but 
they all kind of come together with this common theme. Mm. But the, the composers are recognizable, the pieces less so. Mm. So the first piece, originally for guitar, mm-hmm. by Manuel de Falla, is homage to mm. Debussy. I love his work. Yeah. <laughs> the second piece is... Bach wrote a transcription oh. of the Marcello. This is such a Pichero. cool idea. I and then this. Clara Schumann variations on a theme by Robert. Oh. Those are beautiful. And then Debussy homage a Romo. Mm. And then Bach Busson Chicot. It's mm. the heavy, heavy hair. Mm-hmm. And then I'm hoping to expand it in the future season to include Caroline Shaw's Gustav Lindgren. Okay. Which has a bit of Chopin in there. Yeah. It seems to me that you have a real interest and gift in putting together concert (laughs) programs and series and maybe that's a sort of niche that you are in or that you found for Mm -hmm. yourself. Right. And so you're able to just utilize your own interest and your Mm -hmm. own passion and, you know, maybe from doing the immersion series in the UK and realizing this is so interesting. Well, I loved, like you said, it was so educational. Yeah. And actually... I think people's, people think there's a big difference between being a performer mm. and being a teacher. Mm. And actually, I feel like what drives me as a performer mm. is the teaching element. Mm. Remembering that I'm doing this because I love sharing and teaching people and exposing people to new things. Mm. That's why I do it. Which is essentially, I mean, that's education. Yeah. But it's education through performance. Yes. So then it's important to me to play things and put things together in a way that people can understand. Mm. And so I also make sure all of my concerts, a good amount of it is me talking. Yeah. I talk before every piece. Mm. Just to, I mean, it's not a lot of talking. It's not a lecture. A short introduction, mm-hmm. but just something that the audience can connect to on a human level. Yeah, I think is so important, mm-hmm. and so that's been a really big, I think, transition for me artistically. Yeah. Right, coming out of school where you're doing things for a degree, you're fulfilling requirements. To what is my purpose as an artist, and trying to figure that out. Yeah, what do I want to do with it? Yeah. And I think that my mentality towards performing has also shifted to where the concerts don't feel like there's this divide, Mm. right, between me and the audience. Yes. And instead it's turned into a, let me welcome you into my living room and just share this music with you and explain to you what makes me excited about it. Yeah, yeah. Because if I go into it with that attitude it changes things tremendously. Mm. Yeah. And I feel like looking back at your experience in navigating through your education and then career and seeing how education has come into your performance, Mm -hmm. it's really cool to see how you were able to bring those two pieces together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's been a lot of fun. I will say it was a very steep learning curve, Mm. but I do, like I said, I don't like it when I get too comfortable. Yeah. Right? Things start to feel stagnant. So I did worry a bit because I had been in Philly for five years Hmm. doing this doctorate. I thought, I wonder if I'm going to start feeling complacent. Mm. hate that. (laughs) Complacency. (laughs) But then it was just this process of trying to figure out what next has been so crazy Mm. and I think eye-opening and you're constantly learning Mm. about the industry yeah that yeah there's been no room for me to get bored yeah (laughs) yeah well I feel like you're the type of person who wouldn't let yourself because you're just out there (laughs) bringing things in anyway (laughs) yes and I think that's been a big thing too is realizing that if I want to do things then I got to bring them in. Mm. So your career right now Mm -hmm. involves, could you maybe break down exactly the different parts of what you're doing right now? So currently I am 
teaching as an adjunct professor mm-hmm. at the St. Joseph's University. And then I am teaching privately mm-hmm. out of my home mm-hmm. with a few students. And then I am performing. Mm-hmm. And it's just the combination of those three. And then I guess applying to full-time professorships too. That was a lot of my last year. And that took up a lot of energy Mm -hmm. and time um, to put together those applications and then travel for the on-site interviews. Nothing ended up panning out. Um, But I'm actually realizing that maybe if I had landed one of those jobs, I really wouldn't. Have mm-hmm. had any time to continue exploring who I am or where I could go as a performer. Yeah. And so I'm leaning more towards trying to head in that direction mm-hmm. while continuing teaching because I love teaching. Yeah. Without getting, without doing a full time professorship. And again, these all feel like kind of unfamiliar terrain. Mm-hmm. And I don't think it should be. <laughs> there's a lot that feels unfamiliar, yeah. right? But it's exciting. Yeah. At least there's that. Yeah. Um, of, okay, well, if I start bringing in enough concerts, then how am I going to feel about trying to get management? Is that mm. something I want to do? What would that look like? Yeah. I mean, there's something nice over having control over yeah, what you're doing. Stuff. Yeah. So there are a lot of things that I need to figure out. And then also from a moral standpoint, Mm -hmm. I feel like if I'm going to go and teach other people to get a degree, bachelor's in performance Mm -hmm. or a performance degree. So currently I'm teaching, um, it's a bachelor's of the arts Mm -hmm. music degree. So they're doing, it's piano and chamber music. That's what I'm teaching at St. Joseph's University. But if I'm going to go and teach performance degree, and oftentimes these universities require you to recruit Mm. students. And if I'm going to do that, then I'm going to do it having understood the different facets of how to make it work. Yeah. And I don't feel that I understand that yet. Mm. And I think I really morally, I need to know yeah. before I bring in more students. Yeah. I think it's great that you're taking that responsibility, that yeah. you want to take ownership of that. I think it's so important before I recruit other students uh-huh. or say, come get a performance degree with me. Yeah. That I understand and then I can explain to them yeah. how this all works. Mm-hmm. I will say that it is constantly evolving. Yes. Right? Absolutely. And so that's another issue too is that the people that we studied with, right, different generation, mm-hmm. it's a different time. Yeah. So what they, what worked for them doesn't necessarily work for us yeah. today. Yeah. And so my knowledge perhaps will be applicable for a shorter, a short amount of time. Mm-hmm. But hopefully I feel like, okay, I understand it. Yeah. And I understand what it takes to then create a performance career. And so I want to figure that out. First. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's so important. And I think, It just reminds me of a lot of things that you were already doing along the way of like how you wanted to do a doctor in the U.S. before you started Mm -hmm. teaching in the U.S. so that you could better understand the system or even how you were calling a lot of friends when you graduated to figure out the current (laughs) scene, you know? Right. Yeah. What is it? Yeah. (laughs) Trying to understand from people who have been there before or experiencing it yourself what yeah. What is involved? And I have talked with other colleagues um, at different places in universities. And I think one idea that came up was, mm. yeah, there, of course, should be some sort of business-oriented class for musicians yeah. who are trying to make a performance career. Yeah. But then that the teacher has to change for that particular class. Like, we're bringing in somebody, and then they maybe teach that class for 
five, ten years, because it's very specific knowledge. It has to be somebody that's fairly young, Mm -hmm. that's just come out on the scene, that's figuring out how it works Mm -hmm. in the current climate. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, that knowledge becomes outdated, let's say, in five, ten ten years. Yeah, yeah. Right? So then we get a new person to come in who's also working their way up, who can then explain to the, you know, incoming students or soon graduating students what to expect yeah right it's different yeah it's tricky and I think like my whole PhD dissertation was my thesis was called expanding the core of conservatory training Mm. because I think this is so important and I think it's something institutions are really struggling with because I think a lot of institutions realize that it is necessary, but it's finding the time and curriculum, right? Because you're, well, you're not going to do it in your lesson. Yeah. I mean, just the amount of time we had to work on our instrument, right? Mm. You had to use all of that. Yeah. Even that didn't sometimes yeah. feel like enough. Well, and I think especially my experience is, and I feel like my mindset as well, when I entered conservatoire was, like, I don't know if I even have time to do anything else because don't I need to be practicing mm-hmm. all the time? Like there's so much pressure and it's so competitive to reach these really high elite levels Mm -hmm. that I think a lot of students can feel that those other things, I won't, I don't, you know, I I I can't even think about them right now. But I think a lot of us who are now on the other side Mm -hmm. feel in hindsight, oh, actually, now that I'm in it, I realize that there's a lot of things I wish I had better learned or been better equipped for Mm -hmm. earlier. I feel like at least just starting those conversations and helping raise awareness Mm -hmm. amongst, especially like younger students that, you know, it might not feel relevant right now in your training, but like it will become relevant. And so it's best to start it as early Mm -hmm. as possible. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So it was kind of one of the hopes of doing my podcast. Cause Mm -hmm. I remember when I first asked you, right. um, And I was talking to you about coming on and you were saying that you yeah. you were calling friends and just trying to learn all that yeah, you were trying could. to figure it out. Yeah, and that's what we're all trying to do. So mm-hmm. you know, I know I know that you know people listening to your story and hearing about all the things that you have figured out, and so you're able to impart that mm-hmm. to others so that they're able to take that on and be you know a little more prepared for right. what's coming. Right. Right. Hopefully, yeah. so with all of these different parts of your career because you're doing such a diverse amount of things how do you feel like you balance Mm. all of these different things especially with you know life and family and your husband and everything yeah so that's a (laughs) that's a very complicated question Mm. because my husband is also extremely busy yeah he is currently in residency oh wow yes he's in the Yes. In the trenches. <laughs> yes. And he's in his last year oh, wow. of his general surgery residency. So mm. we've been in it for five years. I think <laughs> one thing he says is it's good that I'm so busy. Mm. We're both so busy, and I think we're both so invested in our work that I think it would be more difficult if one of us wasn't yeah right you can better understand exactly you better understand um and then one thing I think that has been very helpful and something that I've said to him many times to avoid burnout Mm. is you got to do something different Hmm. right so it the burnout comes when you're doing the same thing over and over again so Contra dancing. Huh. One, yeah, we went contra dancing a couple weeks ago. How fun. I don't know. Apple orchard. Yes. Back. But just things that are not of the everyday type activities. Mm-hmm. Because I think exploring new things with one another is also really important. Yeah. We've been together now. It'll be nine years mm-hmm. in February. So I think just finding new things to explore. London was great for that. Yeah. And the Philadelphia food scene, really good. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it's just carving out hmm. time, I think. Just making sure that you carve out that time yeah. and it's to do things that are going to, I guess, inspire and excite you. Yeah. Right? I feel like that it's similar to your not letting yourself get complacent. Yeah, right. 
Yes. Which is important in all aspects of life. Yeah. Yeah. It's very important, I think. So that's, yeah, it's been a big balancing act, honestly. Mm -hmm. And it's tough when we're both, so if I have a concert, big concert, and I'm feeling more stressed out than usual, and then he obviously has extremely terrible hours, long hours, right? Yeah. And then we have to cook dinner. (laughs) (laughs) You're tired. Yeah, there was a lot of takeaway involved, I think, in the month before the New York Mm. concert, which isn't health wise but yeah it's, it's like a it's a balance yeah and it's, it's also remembering exactly it's remembering that there are going to be waves of mm. time that are more perhaps stressful than others yeah I think last year was tough because we were both on the job market and both interviewing at completely different places around the country mm. and in the end nothing panned out so we didn't have to do long distance, mm. which was nice. Mm. But then now we're also figuring that out again. So he's still in residency, but he's now going to go work after this. So yeah. now he's on his application cycle, and I'm applying to a few things too. Mm. And if we're going to match up locations or if we're going to live somewhere else, then I'm going to have a base in Philly too. And yeah. so there's a lot of things that are kind of in flux right now. Yeah. Open ended. So. Yeah. But it seems like that has often been the pattern of your life. Mm-hmm. I feel like there's often been a lot of things in flux for you. And I you. guess so. I don't like it that way. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I feel like as you've been, you know, traversing Very, through yeah. that, yeah, yeah. you just are learning how to better manage. I think so. I think I've gotten better at it. I think Roman actually used to say something about how things kind of just eventually reveal themselves to you, hmm. right? Like you'll know it'll fall. It'll fall into place. Yes, exactly. Like things will reveal themselves to you hmm. over time. Yeah. And so I, that's kind of how I feel about our current situation. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting, at least. Yeah. I'm not bored. Yeah. So You're not comfortable. I'm not complacent <laughs> and bored. So. Yeah. Yeah, well, keeping things interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Life yeah. is interesting, so. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> I love to end every episode with a little rapid fire okay. question and answer sure. session. So just whatever comes top of mind. Mm-hmm. Let's go. So yeah. who's your favorite composer? Brahms. Amazing. Favorite piece of classical music? Okay. It's Brahms' first piano teacher. Makes sense. <laughs> How about your favorite movie soundtrack? You to like Stardust. Mm. Inception. That's a good movie. Cool. Inception, yeah. Um, but no, Stardust, I was so into that. Mm. I was in high, high school. That's a fun movie. I don't think I've ever listened ago. to the soundtrack. Yeah, it's myself. really good. Okay. What was the last thing you listened to? My husband has a playlist on Spotify with a very strange, eclectic group of songs. So I don't really know. It's always an adventure. (laughs) I press shuffle, and he continuously adds things. And I I like his taste in music, So, but I don't know what anything is. Yeah, that's a fun way to discover new music that you might not normally listen to. So I don't actually know what I listen to on my way over here. Something on your husband's Yeah, I don't know. Something there. But, yeah, not classical music. I don't usually listen to a lot of that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What, so what genre of music do you listen to most of the time, would you say? Mm-hmm. All kinds. Yeah, all kinds. We have a Spotify playlist of Romanian pop because we got we had our big, fat Romanian wedding. Ah, in, because is your is your husband he's Romanian, yeah. So wow. there's a lot of Romanian pop floating around for a while. I don't know what that would even sound like. Yeah. Just honestly, a very large array. The Goat Rodeo Sessions was on. There was some Philip Glass, mm. quartet stuff. Just the gamut. Just really, yeah, it's not. No. And that was actually, I mean, growing up, my dad played every genre of music in our house. Oh, that's cool. Because he played the drums. Okay. So there was 
rock, jazz, heavy metal. rock, <laughs> exactly. ACDC, <laughs> right? Like everything. Oh, uh, so what an education in music. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what are you currently reading? Currently, or just finished reading? I just finished reading tomorrow. Tomorrow and tomorrow, tomorrow, mm. or tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. That was an interesting book. It's about it's a love story, but a friendship love story. Okay, not a love story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. It sounds nice. Yeah, it was good. And then before that was the Immortalist. It's about four siblings go to see a fortune teller when they're kids and how that impacts how they lead the rest of their lives. Oh, interesting. If you knew when you were going to die, how would it affect mm. how you lived it? And Piss Rex kind of self-fulfillment maybe stuff. Or not. Yeah. Interesting. I'm intrigued. Yeah. It was good. Okay. It was very good. And then I have the second book of Handmaid's Tale on my mm. next to my bed. Yeah. To be read. Yes. Who is a musician you really admire? Mm. Martha Arbert. Mm. The pianist. Oh, okay, yes. okay. Mm-hmm. She's great. So you really admire her play? I do. Yeah. Christian Zimmerman. Hmm. Yes. Okay. Nice. Mm-hmm. Finally, if there was one resource, so a book, a movie, a podcast, anything that you would really recommend that someone should go check out right now, what would yeah. that be? I think it's that book, How to Make Friends and Influence People. Mm. You found that really helpful? Yeah. My teacher for my doctorate program, Sarah Davis Butner, recommended that I read it. Mm hmm. And it's just, it talks a lot about working with people and approaching people. Yeah. A lot of what you were talking about, putting yourself out there, Mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Yeah. Okay. Good to know. Is there just a final piece of advice that you would want to leave listeners, Mm -hmm. either if they're, you know, a student entering music school or about to enter the career field? I think it's important to figure out what makes you different and Mm. unique and also what brings you the most joy and excitement and then just, like, go in that direction. Yeah. 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 That leads you Mm. to where you need to go. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like that really sums up a lot of what we were talking about in our episode because I feel like you know for you you were really able to do that Mm -hmm. and you know honing in on what brought you joy and what was interesting to you and then bringing that to your art and your craft Mm -hmm. and and sharing that with others so amazing advice well thank you so much for coming on if there's anywhere that people could connect with you find out more about what you're doing concerts that you're doing that kind Mm -hmm. of thing yeah my website Okay. It's just my name, www.amicoedwards.com. Perfect. I will link that in the show notes. Lovely. Thank you so much Thank for coming you. on. I really Thanks appreciate so all the advice you have to share. <laughs> I'm sure it will be incredibly valuable. And, yeah, I'm just excited to see what comes up next for you and all you're going to do in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Orchestrating Your Career podcast. And a big thank you to Emiko for sharing her journey and her advice. The resources mentioned in this episode and where you can connect with Emiko are all linked below. You can find the podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and other platforms, as well as get more frequent updates on Instagram. To watch videos of all the episodes and get extra behind-the-scenes content, check out the YouTube channel Orchestrating Your Career. Subscribe so you don't miss anything and look out for new episodes on the 1st and 15th of every month. Next episode's conversation will be with Ben Roundtree, a composer, arranger, conductor, brass and handbell musician, and music publisher. Though he's from the U.S., he now lives and works in Germany with his family, so stay tuned to hear his story. Until next time, here is Emiko's piano performance to end our episode, so take it away, Emiko. Emiko.